Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kirsten Wiley and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Ben Ha, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. How does one build an empire on pictures of cats with silly misspelled captions? The Cheeseburger Network, which consists of over 30 popular humor sites such as I Can Has Cheeseburger, Fail Blog, There I Fixed It, Add Emails from Crazy People, has become an internet phenomenon. Its daily collection of laugh out loud cats, fails, and other blunders are the source of endless humor. How did this all happen, and why do over 13 million people come to these sites every day? Here today to tell us about that. Here today to talk to us about this is Ben Ha. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Well, uh, it's it's great to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. I've got a little bit of a warning. If I start drooling, okay, don't take a picture and post it to Fail Blog. Um, <laughs> I went to the dentist this morning. I have to get a filling fixed, and the dentist said, you know, I, I said, I have to give a speech at 1.30, you know, can you make sure the anesthetic wears off? And he says, sure, no problem, it'll be done in half an hour. It's been three hours, and the left side of my face is still numb. So, life is always full of surprises, isn't it? So, I'm going to tell you about probably the greatest surprise in my life so far, which is the, the success of what we do. Um, and it all started out with this picture. So this is the first little cat that was ever posted on the site. And that's where the name comes from, Mike Kenneth Cheeseburger. Uh, it was a boyfriend and a girlfriend in Hawaii. The girlfriend found the photo online, sent it to, his boyfriend, uh, sent it to her boyfriend over IM. He thought it was so funny, decided to buy the domain name. Just like that, misspelled cheeseburger and all. Posted the photo, decided to make it a blog because he wanted to post more photos because they kept on finding more, and that's how it was born. But this wasn't the first little cat. In fact, before that, we had this. <laughs> this was a poster uh, originally created in the 70s of a cat that is supposed to, I guess, motivate you. Poor cat. Uh, but that actually wasn't the first one either. Uh, we actually found before that, in 1905, <laughs> this was a postcard actually found at an antique store in Seattle. And we heard about this over the internet. And, said, and somebody said, I've got this picture, a postcard of a cat with a caption on it. It's in all caps. Um, it was found in a, a, a store in Seattle, and we had to track down this lady. She came in. We, we saw the postcard. We saw the postmark from 1905, and um, we thought this was the first little cat. But it seems like humanity's love for cat pictures and captioning goes even before that. <laughs> <laughs> a little shout out to the uh, Microsoft Cats group. Um, I'm pretty sure that if I ever get a chance to go to Egypt and check out the Sphinx, which is a cat, by the way, with a human head, there's going to be a little hieroglyphic inscription in the front, right? And that, I'm guessing, is going to be the very first little cat of all time. So on January 11, 2007 was when this site was born. And we were born, <laughs> we were born because the internet really changed the world that we live in. The way we interact with information literally changed over a span of less than a decade. It became easy to publish. It became accessible to a lot of people. It connected groups of people that were previously unconnected. I'm sure you've heard of this all this before. But there's a reason why the phenomenon of people actively participating in the creation of you know, cat pictures with funny captions didn't occur prior to the internet. Technology made it that much po more possible and likely that you would participate in this community. So it started in January. And then by March, they were serving up a terabyte of data a week. It was so much data that their $6.99 monthly host called them up. Eric was one of the co-founders and said, uh, you need to get off our servers because you're consuming all of the data for that server. Right? Thousands of websites hosted on one server. His was using all the, info, all the, all the data. Well, I came along in uh, roughly April of 2007. And when I first saw it, it was a, a friend of mine that sent me a link. I said, hey, you should check this out. Went to it. Saw the cat pictures, and I said, I don't get it. <laughs> I, I was like, what, what, what's wrong with the site? I don't understand. It's just cat pictures. But I, I can't read what the hell's going on here. So I didn't go back. Another week had passed. Another friend sent me a like, you have to go to the site. It's so funny. I went there. Still didn't get it. I was like, why do people keep sending me this link to this stupid site I whose name I can't even pronounce? The third email came by, and I'm like, fine, I'll give it one more shot. 
Apparently, I was really bored at work. I kept on clicking links from people over and over again. And I went there, and uh, I found one photo that I liked. And, I can't, and for the love of me, I can't remember which one it was. And it got my attention. I said, oh, I get it. The cats, they're talking. <laughs> and they don't know how to spell because they're cats. Oh, that's funny. Well, that was April 2007. Um, I ended up becoming internet friends with Eric, one of the, uh, one of the two people that started the site. Um, and I just ended up helping him out pro bono just because I wanted to. Um, I showed the data about the site's traffic growth to uh, an angel investor friend of mine. And he suggested, why don't you just buy it? I said, I don't have that kind of money. He's like, all right, tell you what. If, you'll, if you can actually start the company and run it, I'll help you raise money. I said, OK. So I put down $10,000 of my own money to buy a cat blog. <laughs> And then I said, hey, Andy, help me raise the money, because I just put $10,000 down for a cat block I can't afford. <laughs> so that was September of 2007, and the company was born. And amazingly, we've been profitable since our first month. Um, initial startup cost after buying the site was uh, a laptop and pajamas. <laughs> because uh, out of downtown Bellevue, out of a two-bedroom apartment, I would get up, walk to the living room, turn on daytime television, and blog. And that was the genesis of this business. I had quit my job as a product manager for a startup in, in Bellevue, making six-figure income, because I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was really sick and tired of working for uh, a client that didn't really care about what we did. I was really tired of working for a company whose vision I didn't believe in. And I said, you know, life has to be better than this. I had a job offer to go uh, be a product manager for a company in San Francisco, another startup down there. I, I, lo I love the startup environment. I'm just a startup guy. Um, but I really couldn't pass up the opportunity to, do be, to be my own boss again. I had, I had run a startup in 1999, gogo.com days, remember that? Um, didn't work out so well. So I said, you know what, it didn't work out so well last time, so I should really try again. Um, so I did. So I came in in September of 07. Uh, this is the millions of page views. Uh, this is when I showed up. The, the, the site had actually been kind of flatlining uh, before that, and um, magically somehow it started growing again. And I, I really can't take all the credit for it because we really didn't know anything. <laughs> we couldn't tell a banana from a corn. So the thir first thing we did was we didn't change anything at all. We did absolutely nothing different, except we went through a regular schedule. right? So every X number of hours, we would post up a new photo, and we posted five pictures a day. We just basically said, look, we're going to guarantee you five pictures a day that's actually of some decent quality. And then you will come and you will laugh. And that's the only thing that actually made a difference between flatlining a website versus one that grew. And then we started building new websites. We're like, well, you know, that works so well. Why don't we actually build some more? So we came across a bunch of people on the internet uh, who were taking musical lyrics and turning them into graphs using Excel. It's like, wow, that seems quite nerdy. I like it. <laughs> so uh, we started a site called Graph Jam. And, um, Today, what you see there is a, is a builder. So you actually go online. You don't need Excel. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you can literally just drag graphs. Actually, a little side note, um, kind of funny. We ended up getting a lot of submissions when we actually uh, launched a builder. And a lot of them just weren't funny at all. They looked like internal business graphs. And we kept on getting more and more of these. It turns out somebody was using them to actually create presentations. Now, mind you, unlike Excel, you can literally just grab a corner and decide that that's 30%. Like, you don't need numbers to create Excel. <laughs> I wish I knew which company that was like a short their stock. So, <laughs> Enron? Um, so, yeah, so we actually posted an Excel uh, template that said, this is how you create a graph. And we put the instructions in Excel. And you have, to, you have to download that template, modify the numbers, and email it back to us. And I thought, God, there's no way this is going to work. It, it's so much harder than putting captions on a cat photo. But it did. There was a small group of people who were passionate enough to actually keep doing this. And what had happened was they had taken the site from my original concept, was, which was musical lyrics in graph form, to life in graph form. So we went with it. That's what the word jam it has to do with music, but the site has nothing to do with music anymore. Right? We, let the, we let the people take over the site. And that was one of the best things we did. Um, and then we launched more sites. It's remarkable, isn't it? Um, <laughs> even right down to the nose. I actually put that up like right after Michael Jackson died. It was like it was like somebody in the back was like, "Too soon," you know. It's like, and then we obviously had to have a dog site, right? So what's up with the crazy words, right? What's up with all the misspellings? 
Well, it comes from the fact that we're combining a whole bunch of different technology-based uh, uh, linguistical roots, I guess. Uh, the ones elite speak, for, uh, standing for elite, which is kind of a hacker-based language, uh, mixing numbers and letters. One is texting. Uh, one is common misspellings. And I just throw in Shakespeare there, it's misspelled, I know, um, for a reason. It's because English as a language evolves. Unlike French, which is actually a governmental body that decides what French is and decides that this is the proper way to do things, English is a language that is easily adaptable. It's a flexible language that can borrow words from other cultures and decide that, that tomorrow uh, the word the is now spelled te, right? <laughs> And if it wasn't for Microsoft Word trying to co constantly correct you, it would, te would probably be an acceptable spelling by now. <laughs> but internet culture has adapted the word te to be something that's meaningfully different than the. Right? The is something that we know. It's very boring. Te, if you use T-E-H in, in, in language on the internet, it's actually used to describe something slightly derogatory. Right? Te internet is something you down upon versus the internet, which is something you look up to. Right? There's little subtle linguistical differences that we're introducing into culture by misspellings and by cultural paradigm changes. So based on the language, we built books, of which the editors came back and said, how am I supposed to edit this book? Because I don't know how these things are supposed to be spelled. <laughs> <laughs> so the books are in the back. Um, two of them, based on I can achieve, were New York Times bestsellers. Um, and somebody asked me uh, uh, at another speech then they said, why do people buy these books? I said, no, that's a great question. Because they said, you can get them online for free. And I said, but you know what? It's still a little weird to take the laptop to the bathroom. <laughs> that doesn't explain the reason why you're a New York Times bestseller. I don't know if there's you know, th hundreds of thousands of bathrooms in the United States that's got this book in it. I don't know. But basically, we know that people love the community they've built. And, and I say it very specifically. It's a community that they have built. And because it's a participatory community, they're more likely to love it. And I think that's why they buy, they buy these books, because it's a part of who they are. And of course, can't forget Failblog. <laughs> Failblog, we purchased from a person in London in uh, April of 08. I don't know if you've noticed yet, but I'm going to use my laser pointer. There's a bicycle. There's the lady friend. Something's wrong with this banana. Uh, it was a pretty small blog that we bought at the time, um, and it's grown to be our largest site uh, in the network today. Uh, based on fail blog, somebody has sent us a, a, an email um, with, a, with a video in it. And this was, I think, I want to say June, or, or it's pretty early on. And uh, one of our moderators came to me and said, how do we put videos on our site? I'm like, I don't know. Just, just post it on YouTube. We'll see what happens. Right? It was kind of like an offhanded thing. We didn't really think about it. Uh, within 18 months, we became the number one comedy channel on YouTube, the fifth most watched channel of YouTube of all time. Uh, and now, uh, a little over two years later, we've served up more than a billion video views, which makes us one of the largest video distributors in the world. All because somebody sent us an email and said, this is funny. This is my friend falling on his face. You should post it. <laughs> and if you haven't been to Failblog before, these are the type of things that we post. It's not exactly highbrow, right? This isn't like, <laughs> not highbrow, not highbrow. So this is the kind of stuff that we specialize in, right? Things that are easy to understand, not because we think the users are stupid, but because people are busy. People's lives are complicated. And we want to simplify their life and make them happy. If we brought you, you know, a Nobel Peace Prize winning tome on what humor is, I bet you none of you would read it. But if a cat says something funny, you will all look at it. That's just the way humanity works. And I'm going to explain why in a little bit. So, we built out the burger family. These are the first uh, uh, six sites that, that we launched after I can cheeseburger. And we kept on growing and growing and growing. And now we've got more than 40 sites. And this is one of our latest uh, successes, Failbooking. It came out of fail, uh, Failblog. People kept on sending funny Facebook-related things to Failblog. And we, held, we sat on it for oh, a good year and a half. And then we said, you know what? It's really time for us to actually start something. Um, by the way, someone's complaining about uh, getting messages every time somebody adds, leaves a comment. There's 106 of them so far of people saying something like exclamation point. That's all they're doing, if you noticed. You've got to love friends. And I'll show you the big numbers. So it took us 23 months from our uh, start date to reach our first 1 billion page view milestone. Today, it takes merely three months for us to reach that milestone. The acceleration has been absolutely phenomenal. We reach about 15 million people every month across the globe. And if you guys are, how many of you are familiar with WordPress? Okay, 
It's one of the most popular blogging platforms out there. It may actually be the most popular today. Uh, we account for 12% of WordPress.com's traffic globally. So one out of every, what is it? Can't do the math. Thank you. One of those, one of those numbers. Pages that you go to WordPress is, is ours. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's, it, we, we actually started launching websites uh, without our actual name on it because we're like, you know, we're afraid of failure, so we, we launched some sites. Like there I fixed it. We launched without telling anybody that, that it was ours. Uh, I think yesterday we had changed kind of the logos around there. I fixed it and then added our cheeseburger network branding and stuff like that. And somebody tweeted, God, these cheeseburger people, they're buying up every blog I like. <laughs> and I tweeted back, hey, dude, we started it, you know? <laughs> That's what I do at night. I tweet. Um, 24 to 1. That's a remarkable number. And this is... For every 24 pages that get, uh, for every 25 pages that it's served up from our network, we actually host one of them. The remaining 24 is hosted by a third party. It's on WordPress.com. You can go get a free blog there, right? Same platform, exactly the same. We use off-the-shelf products as, as, as often as we can. And when we started doing this, somebody came and told us, and, you know, WordPress blogging, it's not going to scale. It's not a real business. I said, well, I'm not really interested in a real business. It's just kind of like, I like doing what I'm doing. I like being my PJs. I like waking up and commuting, I don't know, across the fridge. So, uh, and I said, that's BS. You know what? It's a piece of technology, right? And technology can always be adapted, can always grow. There's nothing inherent in blogging that says you can't scale it. And I said, you know, scaling isn't a function of technology because technology is a tool that you can use. Scaling and growing is based on how we operate as a business, right? So, in November of 07, we got an office in Lower Queen Anne. And the first thing I did was hire a developer because I said, I don't know how to code. So all the HTML that you see on the site that looks wacky, thanks, that's me. Um, so I said, you know, you're going to have to fix this stuff up. And I wanted to make sure that he was not distracted, right? Because his time is very valuable. And I said, you know, I got to figure out a way to make sure that you can do everything that is valuable for our business. So I said, don't worry about the blog. I know that all of our traffic is on these blogs, but don't worry about it. Somebody else will take care of that. We're using off-the-shelf products. There's millions of people using it. If that site goes down, I don't even have to call WordPress because there's so many people who call WordPress on our behalf saying, it's down. <laughs> we don't need to do that. So it's, it, we've decided you know, we want to focus on what makes us different. And I realized that I was the obstacle. I kept on saying, you should do this one moment, do that the other moment. Kept on distracting. And I said, OK, you know what? Put a plan together. 30 days, tell me what you're going to do for the next 30 days and I'll let you do it. You don't even need to come into the office. All right. So I put myself out of the equation. Because I had these, I wanted, I wanted to grow. I had my pride, I had my ego, I had, I had all these assumptions about who we were and, and that made me kind of jump from task to task and, and kept on distracting our company. So I wanted to actually leave them to do what they do best and leave myself out of it. And one of the best things we did was we kept our lazy attitude. Um, Eric, one of the co-founders of Icon and Cheeseburger, one of the best things he told me was, you know, and I said, you know, why is your site on WordPress? Why is your lolcat builder one page, right? It's like a .NET page, like a single .NET page. He's like, oh, because it's, you know, I'm lazy. Like, I don't want to work 24-7. Like, I just want to make the simplest thing, and I think the users are the same way. So if I make it something easy for them, and they can be lazy too, I think it'll all work out. And he was absolutely right. So. The lazy attitude made us focus on the difficult decisions, right? If you're working 24-7, you tend to go crazy. You tend to do all these little things and try things out and, and all that stuff. And when we were small, we said, you know, we really can't do all those things. We can only do a few things well. And what are those few things? And that's what we focused on. So from my perspective, I asked the question, what if I wanted to work just four hours a week and still be successful? What would I need to do? Like, what is the core value proposition of this website? And that's what led us to say, you know, instead of ad hoc posting cats whenever we find them, we'll go to a schedule, right? I can literally schedule these out. I can literally schedule three days in advance and go away. Great. Fantastic. Worked well. From the user's perspective, it was great because if the users had 40 seconds, what do they want from us? They wanted reliable humor. They wanted to laugh every time they came to the site. Great. I can give you a schedule in which at 9 a.m., there'll be a cat. You can show up. Well, when you get to your desk at the office, pull up our website. It increased our traffic so much, it, was, it allowed us to do so much more beyond that. We actually could now do more than just one thing at a time. 
And that, that's what I call a beautiful alignment, right? Company making tough decisions as to what, why they're important to their users and making sure that it aligns with the user's deci uh, decision of why they come to you in the first place. So I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by this lazy attitude. This is the detailed specifications for one of the most highly scalable and popular image manipulation software on the web, otherwise known as our lolcat, basic lolcat builder. It allows you to upload an image, in this case a green box, and add three lines of caption, line A, line B, and line C. That's all you get. You can't move the text around. You can't spell check. You can't do anything but add three lines. You can leave them blank if you'd like, but you can only do three lines of text. Somebody asked the question, what happens if the caption is too long? Okay, so we looked at the choices. We could, I love the fact that it wraps here, auto scale down the font size, right? If it's too long, we can scale it down. We could wrap the text. We could warn the user and say, eh, sorry, your, ca your caption is too long. Or the last thing, which was to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, guess what we did? That's what happens if you write something too long. It just runs off right off the side of the page. Doesn't give you a warning that it's too long, doesn't give you a pop-up box, doesn't wrap, doesn't scale down the font size, it just keeps going. When we were um, told by our host to get off their server again, um, <laughs> there was a folder with more than a million images in it. It cost us $6 a month to host the service. <laughs> by the way, uh, if you're on a Windows box and you've got a million files in one folder, your file, it won't pull up the list. So we spent a month actually writing a script to move those files off. You end up paying for this, by the way, in some way, shape, or form. But the fact of the matter is we could afford to pay for it because the original simplicity worked. So we kept this attitude. And we found out that human nature has a tendency to admire complexity. The space shuttle is a wonderful thing. But I'd never buy it. I probably wouldn't want to go for a ride. But we reward simplicity. right? We buy things that make our lives simpler. But we don't want to buy, we, we're like, oh my god, that's such a great piece of engineering, but I don't want that in my house. We do this all the time. And, and, and as business, we tend to forget why we do that. Oh yeah, that. It's, it's like the number one most tweeting thing. It's I actually put this slide in as a reminder to you guys. <laughs> so I realized that that meant that complexity made our business hard to grow. And so we actually went on a process of actually rooting out complexity in our company. <laughs> and, and the reason we found out as to why we were making things complex wasn't the users. It's because we wanted to impress ourselves. I can make that function that much better. I can make that feature so much cooler. I can do this and that and that. Why? Why are you wasting my money that I'm paying you with making features that are too complicated for anyone? Because the maintenance cost of such complexity comes to bite you down the road. So some people say you can't really avoid complexity, can you? Well, we introduced a methodology. And if anybody can guess MPH, anyone? Anyone? Any guesses? All right, I'll make it easy. <laughs> I'm not forced to pause for the audience. Okay. <laughs> I, don't you love slides that actually give you notes as you're speaking? It's like, I don't have to make sure to remember what happens. Um, it's called Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Why is it called Mr. Potato Head? It applies, actually, this methodology applies to all of our company, technology, org charts, product development, IT. We don't have any IT, actually. So that's great. Um, we, you know, not to be confused with redundancy here. We have that too. We have to make sure you know, everything's doubly redundant. But MPH says, if a significant component is lost, it'll be ugly, but nobody dies. We run a .NET backend infrastructure from top to bottom. When you go to create a lolcat, that's built on the Windows stack. It is completely unrelated to the, Microsoft, uh, to the LAMP stack that hosts our WordPress pages. If our entire server infrastructure for custom code that we've built goes down, the blogs are completely unaffected. You will not even notice that anything has happened unless you click on a link to try to get to the other side. All right? This is Mr. Potato Head. It's ugly, yes. Maybe some things will have a little uh, box with a red X in it, but no one actually has a degraded, uh, majorly degraded experience. It doesn't bring down the whole network. The reverse of it's also true, and this is the part that helps us become a rapidly developing company, is that if a significant component is added, It'll, it's still ugly, but everybody lives. We don't add features that break the entire system. Because we know that our paychecks are paid by the people who view our websites. And that's the thing that we don't want to touch. Like if actually WordPress.com went down um, about two days ago, like the entire WordPress.com infrastructure went down. But our back end infrastructure hosted here was still up. So what did people do? They moved from one side of the, of the fence to the other. Right? 
this kind of interdependency but without a risk is actually very rare today. We tend to build really complicated features that if one of them broke, everything breaks. And, it, and I don't know why it, uh, it actually tends to happen more often than it should. So in order to do this, we actually um, have a philosophy of finding forgettable partners. Forgettable in a good sense, meaning um, we host with uh, WordPress. Guess what? If WordPress goes down, I didn't send them an email saying, hey, you guys are down. Somebody else did. We didn't have to worry about them, right? Like Skype. We use Skype for our, all of our phone calls and, and chatting. I don't need to tell Skype that their service is down. Somebody else will. We don't have to worry about these guys. Azure, same thing. We're a BizSpark partner. We work with Azure. Guess what? If Azure goes down, I'm not worried. It'll be back. Right? These are the type of partners that you want because you don't have time to go look out for their best interests. You are only looking out for your business focus. And that allowed us to free up our development time so that we can spend 90% of it on the core technology, which is the creation of accounts, uh, of pictures, of uploading, of hosting and management, and the remaining 10% to just kind of work with the off-the-shelf technology. So when do you, Mr. Potato Head, your business? If you can plug in or out a better, cheaper, faster solution, that's when you do it. We decided that we are actually a publisher not in the business of publishing. We are a publisher in the business of creating community which meant that we could outsource our publishing platform to WordPress. Right? And one final lesson we learned from that is that the, the old adage was try before you buy. Well, thanks to cloud computing and, and the lowered cost of technology, we can actually prove the methodology before we actually spend any money. Right? If a partner comes to us and says, we'd like for you to use our video hosting system, my initial, my initial response is, how can I pay you nothing until I can find a, uh, make a profit and then pay you something? We use Vidler for our hosting technology. Um, we don't, like, we serve millions and millions and millions of videos every, every month, and we don't pay them a dime. Right? We took absolutely no risk in that deal, and they were more than happy to take it because it, it quadrupled their network size. So that's me. If you have any questions, feel free. And uh, these are some of our new websites. Art of Trolling just launched, uh, soft launched yesterday. And Must Have Cute, if you guys are looking at, um, if you guys know the word kawaii, really cute little products for that. So that's it. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you guys have. Yes? Um, I remember you said you bought the blog when it was really small, it yeah. got big. Um, was that because, like, what changes did you make to it to make it big, or do you think it was just going to grow big anyway? Uh, fail blog we bought because it was, um, I liked it. I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, the guy who ran it was an IT consultant. He was traveling all across the world. And he couldn't update on a regular basis. So when we bought it, we said, let's update it on a regular basis. And let's post stuff that we found was funny. Uh, the first couple months was pretty rough, actually. Um, we posted some pictures that, that the community really didn't like. They thought it was offensive. Well, that's OK. It's comedy. It's humor. You're supposed to offend a few people. Um, and then we got really lucky uh, because the financial crisis happened. And the bank started failing. <laughs> and there's this famous photo of this woman at a congressional hearing. She's holding up a sign that says fail. And it was like it ran all over the, 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 the papers. And then like the search results for fail, like the number of searches for fail went up, which makes me wonder why the hell are you searching the word fail? Um, but yeah, that's how we really got our break. Thank you, Lehman Brothers. Um, yes? <laughs> Deal is, uh, because interest is yes, barrier entry is virtually zero. You can actually, uh, uh, Betsy here can actually start a new blog right now as I'm talking, right? There's virtually no zero uh, barrier to entry. Uh, what the barrier is, is the community. You have to find this community of people who are willing to love you, interact with you, and actually give you content. We get 13,000 pieces of content every single day, right? That's an enormous advantage that we have over the next person. And we see competitors all the time that pop up, but that's okay. The internet's a big, wide place. So, yes. Is it uh, when you're when you're going from your site to say a published book? Is the content licensing a big headache? There? It, yeah, the content licensing when we actually go from a, of an internet to anything off internet is actually a big deal. We have to go and actually go paper up all the rights. So uh, we have personally contacted every single person whose photo appears in our books. Yeah, because you can't go to their house and take out the page when you realize it's not yours. Yeah. Yes. How much of your traffic do you, of new sites do you attribute to the network effect of people that, that go to the old one? And yeah, so um, 
Right, so the, that's a great question. What, you know, what percentage of our, our, our growth comes from the network effect when we add new sites? You know, when do they know that it's ours and how do they grow? Um, we actually don't have great analytics. I know it seems like heresy to say that in this day and age. Um, we use very simple analytics programs. We, we use Google Analytics, we use StatCounter, uh, we use Quantcast, but it's just, we don't really know what to do with that information, so we kind of know how we're doing. We, we keep score. Right? But we are barely learning how people interact between our sites. Um, we didn't realize that we actually served up a billion views of video until somebody asked us and then we actually went and looked. Right? It doesn't really matter at some point because I know that our core business is to make people happy and that has very little to do with metrics. And I think sometimes we lose ourselves in metrics. There's too many numbers out there. And sometimes you can sit there and look at cool numbers all day long and actually not do any work. So we rely on very simple things, like the number of votes on a picture, number of people who favorited an item. Like those things have meaning, so we try to concentrate on those. We actually do want to get better at analytics. It's something that we've actually hired somebody to do in-house. Um, but because we were small, we had to make that trade-off of where can we be lazy. And so we kind of said conventionalism should be put, to, put aside here for now. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to skip you for a second. Yeah. Sorry, you just answered the three questions I had, but kind of a follow-up. Yeah. Um, so are you guys doing anything with keywords to, to discover opportunities? Are we doing anything with keywords to discover opportunities? Yes and no, and I'll dis uh, describe it this way. We, we wanted to launch a cute animal blog. Cute overload, well-respected. Meg Frost, she's a UX designer at, at Apple. She's brilliant. There's no way for me to compete with her. Right? She's been there for like 10 years. Um, so we said, how do we attach ourselves to an internet phrase like, like you know, for example, cheeseburger is something that we actually help promote. The word photobomb is actually the word that we actually help promote to describe when somebody jumps in your photo. Fail, same thing. You know, nomenclature and language is a big part of what we do. We said, you know, how do we find a word that actually describes cute but not saying cute? Because Meg pretty much owns the word cute on the internet. So we found the word squee, S-Q-U-E-E. -E. Uh, it's actually pronounced squee, um, <laughs> proper pronunciation. Uh, so we said, let's use that. So we bought a domain name called Daily Squeak. So it kind of goes back and forth. We, we find a, a, a word to fit the purpose, not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you are relying heavily on user-generated content rather than doing it all yourselves, I guess part one of my question was, when you start something, do you first start with your own in-house content and then open it up for input from the community? Yeah, so um, there's a reason why we started the dog site right after the cat site. It's because when you run a cat site, people send you dog photos. <laughs> and then giraffes and aardvarks. Yeah, you know. We actually, funny side note, um, we outsource the screening of pictures like, to make sure it's not like you know, naked people versus cats um, overseas to a uh, company in Vietnam. And um, there's a little tagging. So we ask, is this a cat, is this a dog, is this a person, what have you. We kept on getting uh, results back that said that would categorize a small dog as a cat. And I was like, I don't understand why, like, it's pretty obvious to me that, that that's a papillon. That's not a cat. I mean, I know it's cat-like, but it's, it's small. Turns out in Vietnam, culturally speaking, they don't have a lot of small pets. So when they see a small dog, they just weren't used to it. Like, we, I'm like oh, wow, didn't realize that that's kind of a, a, a you know, developed world phenomenon of owning small dogs. So anyway, so what was your question? <laughs> just, just oh, yeah, yeah. Between self-generated content and right. generated So... That's, we, we developed a dog site because we got dog photos from the cat site, right? We developed, uh, there I fixed it with, fi uh, with bad homemade fix-up jobs because they kept on sending it to fail blog. So it kind of leads kind of one to the other. You have to start with good content to actually encourage the community to give you good content. So yeah, we, we seed content from other blogs. And then the second part of my question was, I think you sort of answered it, was, was uh, the censorship, and I guess that's yeah. overseas check, checked out. No, actually we brought it back in the United States because of that problem. Um, so we have... <laughs> Thank you, little dogs. Uh, so we've got people uh, throughout the country, and, and they spend basically six-hour shifts going through and making sure that the photos are appropriate, and they, they, they conform to the terms of service. Um, so yeah, we do that all in-house in now. Yes? So what's the revenue model? The revenue model, uh, the vast majority of our revenues come from advertising today. Uh, and uh, the other two portions are publishing and licensing from the books, and also merchandise. Uh, we actually have a internet culture t-shirt store which is called lolmart, L-O-L Mart shirts.com. And basically, we, it's like shirt.woo if you're familiar with that. We post a new design every day. It's something to do with internet culture, and then people buy it. So, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, 
I'm just wondering how many people are on your team. There are, at last count, 35 of us on the team. Um, seems like a lot of people to run a cat blog. Uh, but yeah, there's actually 35 of us. Um, and we are currently, we have a 1,500 square foot office, which I believe is a little bit smaller than the room that you're in. And there's 30 some people working in it. So we all work out of two foot by four foot folding tables. And everybody gets a folding table, including myself. No one has offices. And we like just have a big pit. And uh, we decided that we had to move because A, obviously we're running out of physical space to put people. Um, and then B, somebody plugged in a water heater to the outlet and it took down an entire row of extension cords. So we're like, all right, it's time to move. So, yeah. How do you bubble the good content at the top? Excellent question. How do we know the good from the bad? So either I can tell you I think it's funny, right? The traditional publishing model. I am an editor. I have a degree. Ergo, I am God. Or we could ask you, right? So what we did was after the, uh, uh, the screeners look at the content, we put the voting back onto the user base and say, thank you for submitting your content. Now tell me if you think that the other stuff is funny. So not only do we not create our own content, we also do not make judgments on the quality of the content that you send in. Right? It's, um, God, I love the internet. <laughs> Our users who send in the content do the work of filtering them. Right? I mean, it's, 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 like, an, it's like an amazing paradigm. Like it used to be that that was unthinkable. Right? Why, would, why would anyone send you anything other than a letter to the editor? Right? And why would you let other people vote up the best editor, letter to the editor? That's crazy. That's our job. No, actually our job is to create the community that loves the content and to make sure that they're having a good time. So we, you know, we didn't want to make those editorial judgments. Yes, back there. Is that an exit strategy or is it just too much? Do I have an exit strategy? <laughs> I don't want to exit. Um, it's one of those things where like, you find a calling in life. You know, you're born, your parents tell you, you, you have a destiny. <laughs> right? And then I'm like, what's my destiny? I went to Northwestern University, got a degree in journalism, uh, graduated in 1999, went to work for a dot-com. Uh, all my friends thought they were so clever when they stayed with newspapers and the dot-com burst happened. Now who's laughing? Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it only took 10 years. Uh, I, I don't want to exit. It's kind of fun. Uh, you know, I, there's a great team of people that we work with. We talk about internet culture. We, I feel like 19, I feel like, um, the 1950s all over again when TV came into uh, uh, popular culture and, and changed everything. That's where we stand today when it comes to the internet. The internet is finally developing culture of its own and it's spreading throughout the world, not just the United States. We happen to live in a country where um, freedom of speech really enables us to experiment with pushing the limits of what content is acceptable and how content should be created. Um, there was a ruling yesterday of uh, three Google executives were convicted in Italy because Google Video uh, posted a uh, um, mentally handicapped kid getting beat up by some people. And the courts in Italy decided that that was Google's fault. That doesn't happen in this country. And that's very, very important today. Because without that kind of protection, right, it's not a great thing to publicize the fact that somebody got beat up. But what makes Google's hosting of the video any more different than a news showing it, right? And that's kind of the, the parochial view of information, that it's bad. Well, it's absolutely not true. Because the moment you believe that information is bad, that's the moment you decide that humanity cannot make a judgment for itself. Information is a tool for humanity to decide what is good and what is wrong. Right? And if you take that away from us, society suffers. So, yeah? My fifth grader wanted to know if you have a cat. I do not have a cat. I'm actually allergic to cats. <laughs> I have a dog that would be classified as a cat in Vietnam. <laughs> so yes, answer. Yeah. yeah, short answer, no. Yeah, I'm gonna find that cat. That one out of twenty thousand cats uh, don't have the um, dander pol uh, allergen, and I'm looking for that cat. But unfortunately, when you go to the shelter, there's so much dander you can't figure out which one's which. So, yes. So you might have touched on this briefly when, when you're talking about shirts, but your revenue model? Yeah. So is it, so are you guys just ad-based and then people buying stuff? What's the breakdown? Yeah, for that's, that's about it. I mean, it's, we're about like 75% uh, 70, ad-based. That's the bulk of our revenue. So like when January 2009 came along, like it was like the end of the world. Um, I don't know if you heard, but like, 
you know, venture capital firms were sending out big giant memos to their um, companies saying, lay off everybody except yourself um, because the world is coming to an end. Uh, you know, we saw all those forecasts. Luckily for us being on the internet, we bounced back very, very quickly. Yeah, it was, it was horrific to watch the revenue drop from December to January. It was literally like, holy crap, we're going to disappear. Um, the cap business is over. But it wasn't. It actually bounced back very quickly by April. So the internet is surprisingly resilient. Um, yeah. So with some 40 networks in your site, obviously you're working to kind of ride the wave of coming internet memes. Are you seeing some of the sites kind of fall out of favor as perhaps memes uh, fall out of the public consciousness? Yeah, I, I actually haven't seen that. Uh, one of the remarkable things as to why people show up here to listen to me is that the phenomenon of I can ask Cheeseburger has been around for more than three years now. Right? It's remarkably long lasting for the, for, for the internet age when and our attention spans are very short. Um, November of 07, just after I started, People Magazine called and said, we'd like to feature you in our magazine. I said, great, what is it for? Top fads of 2007. I said, no thanks. I will not give you any photos. I was so afraid of this being a fad that I would actually give up being in, in People Magazine, right? which would drive tons of traffic. And, and actually, it's a philosophy that we've held on to today, which is we don't start websites if we don't think it will last. If it doesn't tie itself back to something that we hold as a core of humanity, for example, lovely listing, singular lovely listing, which is a blog about horrible real estate ads, right? That's part of America. <laughs> There's nothing we love more than to make fun of our neighbors' houses, right? Yes, we will do a blog around that subject, but we will not do a blog around other things, such as, um, as famously quoted in Wired magazine, a site about dogs humping things. Right? It's a one-note joke. Have you ever seen a dog hump something? You've seen it a million times. So, yes? Related to that, do you keep close track of forums like 4chan and something awful, or are you mostly self-contained? We're mostly self-contained. Uh, we, uh, I, I visit 4chan on a regular basis, just because I think it's funny. Um, also, kind of mind-boggling at the same time. <laughs> I, I go there because I like it. I don't go there for business anymore. Right. Um, to be honest, I didn't start like an issue where somebody else did. When they actually found the, the lolcat photos online, it actually, they actually didn't know about 4chan until afterwards. So what had happened was 4chan ser uh, uh, served as a breeding ground for these memes. And once they leave 4chan, it became more acceptable for other people to participate. Because 4chan is such a hard place to live in. Um, so most of meme creation today is actually done outside of 4chan. Right? The, the practice of creating memes, the, uh, uh, an idea that is transmitted from person to person virally, uh, it has actually left 4chan, um, which is to their incredible, incredible credit, because uh, it's an amazing community. So, Anyone else? I saw a hand back there once. Yeah. I was just going to ask along the same lines. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the internet's a big place, new competitors come up every day, There's something like 4chan and uh, something awful, like uh, Weekend Web. I see being competitive to uh, the trolling one that will be kicking off here soon. That's right. Do you think that you might uh, perhaps provoke uh malcontent content action? Yeah, you know, it happens all the time. People get upset, you know. Um, you know, we, we've got a feud with another, you know, Facebook-based site, and they're like, you stole our idea. And I'm like, guess what? Uh, you can't own this idea. The idea of somebody making a mistake on Facebook, you can't own that, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's just not doable. Um, and if you really think that you own that idea, that's a disconnect between reality and where you are. Right? We do not own the ideas that live on our sites. We do not own the idea that we create. Like, literally, there's a law that prevents that. Right? Um, you can protect an expression of an idea or a trademark of an idea, but you cannot own an idea itself. That's actually one of the reasons why humanity progresses, is that we are free to share ideas without having to worry about who owns it. So, yeah, back there. On that same note, what about specific photos? Do you run into problems with it? Yeah, we do. Uh, occasionally, we have people who ask us, hey, that's my photo. Somebody use it without our permission, and we take it down. So, yeah. Yep. Everything that you've said makes me believe that you, you kind of are in this charmed place. Like, you go from your gut to you don't do that much <coughs> analytics. You're having a great time. God bless you. You know, I love, I love going to the site in part because I'm an editor. I'm God. And I love to see yeah. the little people mess up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I want to know if you feel like what you've done has 
any sense of a repeatable formula. And if there's one takeaway in our in what you've said to us today that might contribute to that repeatable formula, sure. or is it screw you, you're just not as golden as I am? <laughs> no, it, there's there's absolutely a repeatable formula. And it's actually a formula we've known for ages. Good content. Content is king. That's really what it comes down to, right? Like you as editors, actually, so let me, I'm not kissing your ass, but let me, let me go through this part. <laughs> we just hired an editor out, out of AOL, New York. We didn't hire a writer, right, who could actually work on a blog. We hired an editor. Why? The proliferation of technology for publishing means that there's more content today than ever before. In fact, the amount of content that users create today dwarfs any professionally created content. So that actually increases the value of good editing. Right? If you can't tell the difference between good and bad, that's a big problem for us. Right? So editors are more valuable today than ever before, whereas writers who do not have a specific um, um, skill set become commodity. And that's what's happened to the newspaper journalism, is that um, reporting about your you know, local angle of a national event no longer has appeal. So that's been uh, you know, the erosion of that market. So this action is absolutely provable. We've proven it internally ourselves that you can take the same formula and focus on the content. And if you do it consistently, people will flock to you and grow. Uh, there's really no magic to it. Uh, somebody was doing a paper our, on, our, on our company, which I thought was pretty funny and kind of useless. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and they, were, they were tweeting about the fact that they're doing this paper. And then she started getting more and more frustrated. And the last thing I read was, they're, they're doing nothing different or original. I don't understand. <laughs> and that's absolutely correct. We are doing nothing original or novel. And maybe that is the novelty in and of itself. You look at our company. We ask people to send in their photos. We ask people to help us choose the best ones. And we post them. It's incredibly simple. There's no patentable technology that we've built so far, at least not that I know of. Right? But a whole business is based on the community, which is something that's radically different than, than traditional publishing. Yeah? Any imitators, especially internationally? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of companies uh, making our business model, you know, creating a bunch of blog-based sites and a bunch of meme-based sites and things like that. Um, I don't know of many successful ones so far, um, but I, I'd imagine it, it's going to happen sooner or later because, again, the model is not that hard to replicate. It's just that the execution is incredibly difficult. So for, follow up on the, yeah. on the revenue model. Yeah. So you have this growth for the uh, uh, traffic, right? Yeah. Net traffic. How many are coming from the old side? How many are com coming from the new sites you acquired? Yeah, um, p people coming to from new sites, old sites, actually, we don't know that information. Um, our analytics is too simple for us to know that. Um, we just do know that it goes up and to the right. And that's, that's what's important for now. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I wish I knew, because actually, that would actually help us. Yeah. Um, oh, actually, somebody. Yeah? Um, so I, I, I wasn't exactly sure what he said. He said, are you guys internationalizing your sites? Uh, no, the question is, are there competitors, especially internationally, and things like that? Okay. And I said, I probably. But, Are you guys looking into international edition? And uh, right now, our business model basically makes it very difficult for us to go overseas because we're ad-based. And that means that um, the ad markets overseas do not fund the development of such um, efforts. 45% uh, no, 40 of our traffic is international. And we do monetize some of that. But um, we mostly cater to English-speaking uh, cultures. Yeah. So you have a, a page out on Facebook. If, as the addition of additional channels, such as that, how has that affected uh, core sites traffic? So uh, our communities and pages out on Facebook, YouTube, and things like that, how have they affected, affected, affected traffic? Anecdotally, they suggest that that actually helps the community. Um, we actually don't know for sure. Um, we'll give you an example, though. Uh, we have one of the largest channels on, on, on YouTube, right? which is on the external community. They don't actually have to leave YouTube to come to our site. Um, but when we, when we have a high traffic month or week in YouTube, we actually see a correlation on our sites. So it serves as a marketing vehicle. Yeah. Somebody in the way back? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that you don't have a particular exit strategy. Do you have yeah. any grand visions, though, where you'll be in five years? And maybe, I mean, you said you're doing video now, maybe yeah. going into television, maybe something else. So. I'd, I'd love to be in television. I mean, I've, done, I've gone to LA a few times, but that's just a world I don't really understand. Um, they seem kind of crazy to me, but it's OK. I come from the internet. I'm sure I, I seem pretty crazy to them. I, 
We try to stick to a very agile formula, literally from a technology standpoint as well. We plan 30 days out, and we try to execute everything in those 30 days. And whatever we didn't finish, we don't finish, and we, build, we move on to the next one. It, the market seems to be so fluid that having a five-year plan seems kind of a waste of time. So we're just going to keep our noses to the ground and see how quickly we can go. Yeah. Yes? So um, what is the structure of your development team, and how many developers do you have? So the structure of our development team is there's a CTO, um, and there's four developers, one UX person, and that was last month. Uh, this month, there's still a CTO, uh, five developers, three UX people, oh, wait, one, I don't know. There's like two UX people, sort of, and then two PMs, and an intern. Yeah. It, it's very fluid. Again, it's just one of those things that we, we're not sure which way we're going yet, so we're going to kind of figure it out. We're just going to find the best talented people that we can find and put them in a room and see what they come up with. Yeah. And, and you know, I don't, I don't mean to sound kind of flippant about the things I say. Um, I, I really learned from my mistakes in the first dot-com bubble when I went in and said, I have a master vision and I'm going to rule the market with this product. And I was so off the mark, it wasn't even funny. Right? So I wanted to kind of do this time, this time around, do it without those blinders on. And that's why I want to listen to the people who work at the company and say, what have you learned in your experience? And I want to listen to the users. So the things that we build into our, our core value is listening to our users. There's a reason why there's a million ways to interact with the content on our site by sharing with other people, by rating it, uh, by adding it to your favorites, because that's a data point for us to understand what the market wants from us. So that's, that's why. And that's why deep analytics doesn't really matter, because at some point, um, when you fragment your, your audience into such tiny groups, you end up with statistically inaccurate information. So we, we like the aggregate. We like the, the, the statistics that we can certainly believe in. Yeah. Yes? Semi, Semi-random apologies to everybody, but do you, does the company as a whole support any causes? Does the company? Yes, we do. Uh, yeah, we, we, we work with the, um, the, the um, Seattle uh, Humane Society. So when we do local events, we try to benefit them if we can. With them. No. Do we do photo shoots? <laughs> <laughs> our, our CTO likes to go to conferences, and people ask what you do, as because they don't know that there's an entire technology behind it. Um, he likes to say that he develops the robots that takes the photos of the cats by chasing them. And there's like there's that moment where everybody's like, "Is that really true?" So anyway, it looks like my time's up. Thank you. Thank you.